Okay, garage tape number three. Garage tape number two will shine a little light on it. Garage tape number three is going to be make three wishes. Three wishes would be kind of nice in this world right about now. Notice how all this is fitting together. Yeah. That's part of the plan. So make three wishes. So in this one I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw three pieces out of this one piece of clay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a lid. So I'm going to throw it off the hump. So I'm going to go ahead and isolate a ball. I'm going to take my two very delicate dainty thumbs and push down right there. And then I'm going to try and raise up a knob here. So throwing in my garage is a little bit interesting. There's not a not a tremendous amount of light in here, as y'all can tell. And so we do have a spotlight aimed right at my face. And if you're wondering about the lighting effect, it's not really a spotlight, it's a plant light. I did notice after the last tape my, grew, my uh, beard grew about an inch and a half. So I did trim it a little bit today. Just, just in case it did it again. So, that's my lid. I do want to make sure that the last the part of the maybe half an inch out on the end is flat. I'm going to go ahead and take the mega line right there. So that's my lid. So now I'm going to make a spout. So with the spout, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to throw it off the hump too. So I want to go ahead and cone it up. This time I want a lot more clay to make my spout out of. So I'm going to center and isolate that ball. I'm going to open it now with this I opened it probably about three inches and I'm going to go ahead and pull a cylinder now I want this cylinder to be somewhat angled in. Now one of the things I think a lot of people do when they throw this is kind of like the, the base of a goblet. I think people have a tendency to try and get it too thin. So I'm going to make sure I leave a little bit of thickness. Now as I neck it in, I'm going to neck in so you can see it start to bunch up. Now when it bunches up, you can see it's bunched up quite a bit now. So now I'm going to go back in and I'm going to make a pull and try and take those bunches out. Now one of the odd things about this, if you look at it, I'm using my ring finger and my pinky finger to make those poles on the inside. 
and I don't know why I do that. I was telling a group of students one time that I'll do that on the inside a lot. I actually switch fingers as I bring the pot up. And I said, I have no idea why I do that. I don't think anybody showed me to do that. But that's the way I've always, always done it. So this beginner who was watching their first demo said, I know why you do that. And I thought, sure she does. She knows exactly why I do that. And I said, really, you know? And she said, yeah. She said, uh, I'm a cosmetology student and she said what they teach us in cosmetology class is the more delicate you want to be you want to switch to your more delicate fingers so when you first start pulling you can see now I'm using my middle finger some people would use their index finger you notice how I was more delicate than Randy on that when I called it my middle finger. Randy would call that his bird finger. And his index finger to Randy is his, his booger finger. So, it is descriptive and I think everybody probably knows exactly what he means when he says that. So you can see I'm going to go ahead and put the handle of my spoon in and make a pull against the handle. Don't you always get an itch right about the time it starts getting thin? So you can see, so I'm just kind of picking up. Now, at this point, I want to go ahead and take my rib, if I can find it. That's the other thing besides getting a nose itch. You can never find the tool you want. So I'm going to go ahead, take that rib, Oops, so this is where I take that little bit of a twist out that I started to get. So notice whenever I'm using the rib, if I have a convex curve, I use the flat side. When it goes concave, I flip it over and I use the rounded side. So, and I can almost go ahead and close that off. I'm going to cut the rim anyway. The other thing I like to do is go ahead and really push it in at the bottom and give myself a little bit of a curve like that and I'm not going to worry about how the end of that that looks right now so now I'm just going to take my wire and go ahead and cut that piece off now when I pick it up I'm going to go ahead and squash that just a little bit so it's kind of oblong now, I'm going to make the base. This is a little bit more clay than I need. And I'm not going to worry about it at this point. I'm going to cut it off the top. So, I'm going to center it lower and flatter. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. When I open this one up, I want the piece to be, have a very low profile. So I've gone ahead and opened it up probably at least four inches. I'm going to go ahead and compress it really good. I'm using a white clay, so I want to make sure I really compress the bottom. So now, when I make my pull, I'm going to keep that pull going really inward. 
And like I say, I had too much clay. But I'm going to go ahead and pull and cut it off the top instead of off the bottom. Or when I was centering it. So you can see I really push that one out. And you can see how I'm keeping the shape going inward. So, it's about as thick as I want. Like I said, I had way too much clay. So I'm going to go ahead and cut the top off. So, at this point I'm going to go ahead and really compress that rim. I'm going to go ahead and chamois it. Just to give it a little bit of strength. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut and clean up the bottom at this point. And I'm going to go ahead now and take all the moisture off the outside and compress the clay. So, I'm going to go back with my Japanese throwing stick at this point and I'm going to push out at the bottom right down here quite a bit. But that gave me a fairly good curve there. So now I'm going to go ahead and neck this clay in. Same thing. I want to do it over several passes. If I feel it start to bunch up, I want to back off on my pressure. So I'm really pushing it in right here. I'm going to come back because I want it to go out even further with my potter's knife and push out right at the bottom. Remember when I get up to the midpoint of that curve I want to push out but I also have to pull up. So now I'm just going to take this rib and I'm going to clean it up. Take all the moisture off. Once again, I like to establish where the neck starts. I'm going to go ahead and compress that bottom. Clean up the lip one more time and make sure it's nice and round because it kind of flattened out a little bit there. Now, I do like this red rib. I'll go back and make one final pass over it with that red rib just to kind of clean up that curve. To me it's a little bit easier to do with the red rib than it is with a metal rib. And then just like with most everything. Now at this one I'm going to have to pick up the back end of that rib with my pinky finger. And I'm going to push in on the edge. And I'm going to draw it down and get my spiral. So, that's kind of it. I might take this tool at this point. And I'm just going to come right in here. And undercut that piece right there. Because I like it to undercut. Kind of lifts up the shape. Casts a little bit of a shadow. Then I might clean it up more time. So that's it. So if you haven't guessed what we're making is a good old-fashioned genie lamp. So it's kind of like I talk about with teapots. I really like the idea that you have to take four pieces. You take the spout, you 
take the body, you take the lid and the handle, take all those four pieces and once they're through the composition, they have to look good together. So I think it's one of the nice things to do with clay. Teapots, yours, a uh, genie lamp like this really tells what a potter can do. So that's it. Everybody stay safe. All right, so we're going to put our genie lamp together today so we can complete our three wishes. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and make my handle so that it can be kind of setting up before I attach it while I'm doing the other parts for the, the body of the, the lamp. So I'm going to roll a carrot. So while I'm making my genie lamp, I'm also cooking ribs today. So, if my mind wanders, we know where it's gone. So, I've rolled out my carrot, I've flattened it. I'm going to go ahead and pull. Now, I don't want it to get too thin because with all of that, the, the three pieces down there that supports this handle, it's got a little bit of weight. So, one, two, three, side. And I want to keep it fairly wide through here. I think that's the thing a lot of people do when they first start pulling handles is, is they're too narrow through here. And so I want to keep a little bit of width. So one, two, three, almost no pressure. Just let the repetition and gravity and the moisture do it. When I'm all done, I'm going to take, just run my thumb down the middle. And it doesn't have to be very long because that body's not real tall. So I'm going to take that now and I'm just going to kind of fold it over right here and let it be setting up while I'm doing the body. So I threw the spout, it's set up, it's a little bit drier than I'd like, but, but we're going to go ahead and make the best we can with it. I'm going to take this and just lightly bevel it. So that it fits the curvature of the body. So here's the body. Isn't that the way it always works? Just about the time you get going, your nose starts itching. I'll go ahead, put a little slip on it. And put it, kind of stick it on and work it where it leaves me a mark of where the outline for the spout fits. And I'll go ahead and cut that out. One of the things I didn't get when I was no longer allowed back in the studio was a, a scoring tool. So we're using some finishing nails out of my nail gun. Seems to work pretty good though. So I'm going to score that side. Score this side. Put a little bit of slip on. Talked to Randy the other day. He says he's social distancing. Says he's fishing a lot. He can't figure out why those fish or how they know about social distancing because he figures that's the only reason why he hasn't been able to catch any because they're doing their part too. So, 
I'm just going to stick that on. I'm going to go over it with a little bit of moisture. My finger. Now depending upon how I feel about how it's attaching, I might put a little coil there or I'll just go with that. This was a little bit dry. Like I said, the spout, the body's not, but the spout is. So I think what I'll do is go ahead and just roll a small coil for the, the bottom of the spout. So just a real small coil. Randy's not going to be impressed that I told you about that story about social distancing with the fish. He actually keeps telling me how big they are, except the ones that, you know, all the ones that got away are the big ones. Now the interesting part about doing a spout like this, I'm going to cut or bevel off the end. And what you have to do is account when the spout dries, it's going to twist back. So you have to give a little bit of a bevel or an angle to your spout. So the wheel's going counterclockwise. As you're necking it in, it's torquing it clockwise. So as it dries and is fired, it's going to roll back counterclockwise. Now the problem is, is you never know how much, because it all depends on how far you took it in and how quickly you torqued it in. But what I'm going to do is just take this trimming tool. And what I did was I lined up the bottom of the spout with about the neck of the genie lamp. So now when I cut it, I'm just going to take this rib and I'm going to turn it a little bit. Uh -oh. We went a little too much, but it's okay. And that's because it's a little bit dry. So, as you can see, it's turned this way just a little bit. And hopefully as it fires, it's going to level out. So I'm going to go ahead and just lightly take a sponge here and kind of clean that up a little bit. Now, what I used to do with these, you have to make sure if you put oil in them, you have to make sure that you seal them. Now they used to make a sealer. I haven't made any in so long. I don't know if they still do. It used to be Axner's or Aftosa was the company that sold the, the best sealer. Or you can use polyurethane. Now once you put that in, you do have to let it dry. And, and that's at least overnight. Polyurethane is probably going to take even longer than that. So you can see that it has a little bit of an angle this way so that as it turns back it's going to level out. Now the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead normally I'd let this sit a little bit longer but I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to score it here I'm going to score it here. Put a little bit of slip on it. Now I'm going to take the handle. 
I'm going to take a hold it like this and I'm going to cut a bevel back this way because when I put it on I'm going to take that bevel and just join it right there and then normally I just push it on at the bottom here push on and do one and two now as we look at that it's too vertical or too straight up and down so I think what most people do with handles is they fuss with them a little too much and you don't want to you just kind of want to let it fall into its own natural curve so I might even take it and just kind of jiggle it that handle could have been a little bit longer so that's my genie lamp I'll let it sit for a while I'll come back and clean it up a little bit and here's the lid so I'm going to put the lid on. So that's a completed genie lamp. So once it's all fired, you know, I'll cut a little cotton welting that you can get at any fabric store. You can actually buy fiberglass wicks. You put it in, you pull it out to a certain distance to get a flame. Depending upon how far you pull it out, that's how long your flame will be. It will, though. If you get it pulled out too far, it will smoke. So, that's it. Can't wait to get it finished so I can get my three wishes. Alright, see you next week.